Today we want to solve some equations. We talked about performing inverse operations in reverse order. Our plan here, this now this is a technique for solving equations that applies when the equation only has one instance of the variable. So we just track a list of operations that happen to the variable. That's going to be the part where we read the equation, and then we're going to come up with a plan for solving that equation. And then we're going to grab our calculating machine and do all the work on the calculating machine so we don't have to write so much down. Once we have this plan in place, so we have to learn how to um, invert all of the operations. And some operations have uh, quirks and features that we have to deal with as we go, like even exponents produce plus or minus. So we have to know that if there's an even exponent, when we invert that, we're going to have to have a plus or a minus. Also, with trig functions like sine and cosine, we know that there are infinitely many solutions. So we're going to have to deal, learn how to deal with that because our calculator is only going to give us one inverse. So we're going to have to figure out um, how to express all of those. So undoing an even exponent produces two solutions. Undoing a truth function, sine or cosine, produces two solutions in the first full cycle. And then we have to adapt that to cover all the rest of the cycles. So each has a very similar quirk or feature. When undoing it, we get more than one solution. That's the big thing that we have to do. So watch out for functions. We want to watch out for, oh, not functions, let's say operations. We want to watch out for operations that aren't strictly speaking invertible, that produce more than one solution. when inverted. Strictly speaking, this means that they're not invertible, but it'll be invertible enough. It's just that we have to know some extra stuff to do it. So the ones that we're thinking of are even exponents, and our new player in this game, sine and cosine. Let's talk about the basic operation of um, the, the, the basic method for solving equations by performing inverse operations in reverse order. So for example, This, this, I don't know if this is one I've done before in this class or if it's one that I've just done before historically of all time and including together. So what I want to do is come up with a plan or uh, come up with a plan for how to solve the equation. I want to read what's going on in the equation. So first note that there is only one instance of the variable x. What is happening in the equation is that x on the left has some operations happen to it, and it results in 11. So when we read the equation, we're thinking, what happened to turn x into 11? That's what we're thinking of. That's the read the equation. So first, read the equation. So we're thinking. What happened to turn X into 11? So 
So there's a bunch of operations here that apply to the X. And we uh, the result was an 11. X turned into 11 because some stuff happened to it. So in the read the equation part, we're going to say X got turned into 11 with some operations. And I just start with the X and I write down what happened. So I see there's a cube, there's a multiply by two, and there's a subtracting of five. So we're just going to follow the order of operations. What if I plug something in for X? The first thing that happens, there's times two and being raised to the third power and subtracting five. The first thing that happens is we cube it. That's the first operation. X got raised to the third power. Then according to the order of operations, the next thing that we should deal with is multiplying by two. So the second operation that happened is that X gets multiplied by two. Then the third operation that happens is we subtract five. And then we land at 11 after that happens. So there is us reading the equation. So that's what it looks like to read the equation. Notice that I said read the equation. I didn't say write this down all the time. I know you're taking notes, so it's okay to write it down. I'm not going to stop you from doing that. The next phase is to do inverse operations in reverse order. This will come up with a plan to turn the 11 back into X. So in our, our plan is going to take 11 and turn it back into an X. So first, the last thing that happened to the to to on the left was we subtracted five. So that's the first thing that we have to undo. You have to take your so shoes off before you take your socks off. So the first thing we're going to do is undo the last thing that happened, and we'll add five. Right before we subtracted five, we multiplied by two. So now I've got to undo that operation. So the next thing up is we divide by two. And the third thing that happens, uh, uh, the first thing that happened to X is it was raised to the third power. So I have to invert that. The inverse of a exponent is a reciprocal exponent. So we're going to raise to the one third power. I'll take the eight and raise it to the one third power. I picked this one because I knew the answer was going to be a two. So I could do all the calculations just by looking at it. But here we read the equation. This part here is we come up with a plan. And then over here, we are executing the plan. Now, this is a lot of writing to solve this equation, but this is writing that's not taking place. What's actually being written down. Those first two columns, are just things that are taking place in your mind. So these things are just things that we think about. When we read the equation, we're just thinking the equation, thinking what's going on. orange thought bubble. So that's what we're thinking when we see the equation. Then we come up with our plan. And once again, this is just taking place in our mind.
all this stuff is not stuff that we're going to write down either. This stuff is, is stuff that's taking place on our calculating machine. And really, I'm drawing this to see if I can get anybody to draw stick figures and thought bubbles in their notes. Because it's pretty funny when that happens. So this execution of the plan, that's all stuff that's going to be taking place on your calculator. Yeah, I'm... I, I pick equations typically that you have to use your calculator because I'm going to ask you for two groups of things. But getting to use a calculator um, is not effective if you don't know how the calculator works. So, uh, one third powers. The reason that I like fraction exponents is. Um, all the buttons that we need for fraction exponents are sitting right on the face of the calculator. I don't have to go into menus. Anytime you have to go into menus, it's kind of annoying, at least on the TI calculator. So what would happen is we would read the equation, we would come up with our plan, and then we would execute the plan, and that would take place entirely on our calculator. The first thing we do is we start off with 11, and the first thing that happens is we add 5, and then we divide by 2, and then we raise to the one-third power and come up with the 2 that way. Even though the TI calculator can handle multiple operations at once, we're just going to do things as if we don't have a TI calculator. And maybe we're using an iPhone calculator. I can't demonstrate on an Android calculator because I don't have one. But our we said our plan was to start with 11, add 5, divide by 2, and then raise to the one third power. Now my iPhone actually has a cube root button on it. So I could do a cube root button. Or I could take the 11 plus five, divide by two, and then raise to the one third power. I still need parentheses, so I'll hit the X to the Y button. I'll say raise this to the parentheses, one divided by three, close parentheses, then equals. So because the cube root button is sitting right there on the calculator, maybe we just want to use that. Until, of course, we have something to the fifth power, in which case we don't have a fifth root button on our calculator. And so we do it's right there, but we have to push a lot of stuff. Yeah. As far as what you write on the paper, it's just whatever is in the box, too. So you want to read the equation, come up with a plan, and then execute the plan. I'm going to use these same operations. I'm just going to do them in a different order. Let's suppose we have um, 2 times x minus 5 cubed equals 11. Here, a different order of operations took x and turned it into 11. I've introduced parentheses, and the parentheses highlight the operation that I want to go first. In this case, the first thing that happened to x. So once again, let's write down our plan. What or Let's read our equation. The first thing that happens to x is we subtract 5. Then the next operation, once we subtracted 5, I got times 2 in the third power. Now order of operations comes into play. Repeated multiplication goes first, so to the third power. And then third, we multiplied by 2. There we are reading the equation. Once again, this is taking place in our minds. 
thinking this. And now we're going to come up with a plan to turn 11 back into X. The last thing that happened was multiplying by two. So the first thing that I'm gonna undo is multiplying by two. The second thing that happened is a third power. So I'm gonna do a one third power. And the third operation will be to add five. This will take the 11 and turn it back into X. So on our calculating machine, we're gonna start with the 11 and we'll divide by two. And then the next operation would be 5.5 .5 raised to the one third power. And now I need a calculating machine. Grab a calculator. Take the 11, divide it by two is 5.5, .5, raise that to the one third power, right in the blade. Raise that to the one third power, and that's going to be 1.765, which we're not going to bother writing down except. And then we're going to take the 1.765. And the last operation was to add five. point is to think about, think more, and to write less. In the beginning, when you're practicing performing inverse operations in reverse order, it might be necessary for you to write stuff down. That's why I say show your calculations, not show my calculations. Show your calculations. What do you need to write down to get through this process? On iPhone calculator, We're going to do the same operations. We have to make sure we hit equals in between each one. We'll do 11 divided by 2 is 5.5. .5. Raise that to the one third power. That's a little bit messy. Uh, it's a cube root, so I can just do that. Or I can take the 5.5 .5 and raise it to the parentheses 1 divided by 3, close parentheses, equals 1.765. And then finally add 5. And we get the same thing, just with more digits. Not important digits, just more of them. Same three operations in a different order. We gotta know our order of operations, exponents before multiplication, before addition, unless parentheses tell us that we want to change that up, which they do in this case. Let's read what's going on. First, X gets multiplied by two. Second, we subtract five and third, we raise to the third power. That's what turned X into 11. Whatever we started with, first we multiply by two, then we subtract five because multiplication goes before addition. And then we'll take the result and raise that to the third power because the parentheses told us to wait on that third power. So our plan to turn 11 back into an X, find out what X was, First, we'll undo this uh, third power with a cube root. Next, we'll undo subtracting five with adding five. And finally, we'll undo multiplying by two with dividing by two.
So I'll take my 11 and raise it to the one third power. Make sure my exponent is in parentheses. And that gives us 2.224. Next, we'll take the 2.224 and add five. Get 7.224. And finally, we'll divide by two to get 3.612. On the iPhone calculator, we can take the 11 here. Take the 11 and raise it to the one third power. So to the parentheses, one divided by three close parentheses equals, then add five and then divide by two. It's really weird doing this on a touch screen because there's no feedback like when you're pressing buttons on a calculator. I think the iPhone can you can turn happy feedback on when you're like making the button feelings, that is even worse. Turn on haptic, oh, like, oh look, haptic feedback, so it'll like click when you press buttons. That was awful. I did not like that one bit. I don't know why pressing buttons over here, yes. No response, yeah. This one makes it more pressing button-like, bad, bad, it's all bad, it's creepy. I mean, I'm glad it's there, but ugh. questions. Yes. You use a cube root to undo a cube. Uh, so a one third power. A one third power is a cube root. So to the one third. Is the same as a cube root of X. The reason I like uh, I advocate for uh, X to the one third, even though it's a lot more writing is that all those buttons are right on the front of the calculator. So I type 11 to the parentheses, one divided by three, close parentheses, equal. To get a cube root, um, I don't put the 11 in first. I have to push math and then scroll down to cube root of 11, close parentheses. So that's why I like, I don't like to have to use menu. It's like depend like how do you it's like depends on, it's like a function of how you interface with your computer. Like if you like going up to the menus and the drop down menus and all that stuff, then okay, you're a weirdo. I'm just kidding. For things that have keystrokes, if there's a shortcut like control something to make something happen, I want that. I don't want it buried in some stupid menu where I have to move the mouse around. You know what I mean? Because I'm trying to type, my hands are here on the keyboard. If I got to go into a menu, I've got to lift my hand off the keyboard, grab the stupid mouse, move it around, find out where the cursor was, move it up, and it's just, it's just awful. Let's see a problem with some variations on it. Because we got to watch out when we invert things like even exponents or when we invert trig functions, sine and cosine, we know we're going to get more than one solution. That stuff produces more than one solution. So let's look at an example where that happens. Let's say we have um, the square root. No something squared. I need to invert an even exponent. So let's suppose I've got um, three x to the fourth minus five is equal to, um, 
don't know. Seven. I don't know why I had to change the seven from an 11. I kept the five the same. So the thing that we want to notice here first is that there's an even exponent. Even exponent is going to make two solutions. So we know that there's some plus and minus in our future. Plus or minus in our future. Now we'll just read. What turns x into a 7? First of all, we know there are going to be two things that do this. The first thing what happens to the x is it got raised to the fourth power, an even exponent. Oops, I spelled carrot wrong. The first thing that happened is it raised to the fourth power. The next thing that happened is we multiplied by three. And the third thing that happened is we subtracted five and landed on seven. So let's do the inverse operations in reverse order to figure out what two x's we have. First, we're gonna undo minus five with plus five. Second, we're gonna undo a times three with divide by three. And third, we're going to undo a fourth power with a one fourth power or a fourth root. That's where the two solutions are going to show up, not until the very end. So, lucky us. We'll start off with seven. And the first thing is we add five. Seven and five is 12. 12 divided by three. I knew seven was wrong. I was thinking it was wrong, but oh well. 12 divided by 3 is 4, and I need to take the 4 and raise that to the 1 fourth power. So I grab our calculating machine, 4 to the parentheses 1 divided by 4, close parentheses, equals 1.414. And negative 1.414. Since our two solutions are just opposites of each other, we can summarize with plus or minus. So we can say plus or minus 1.414. Now, when we do the fourth power, or the one fourth power, we can also do a fourth root. To get a fourth root, we have to put in the index that we want and then press the math button and scroll down to x root of four. I prefer the one fourth power, I prefer the fraction exponent. On the iPhone calculating machine, we'll start off with the seven, Add 5, then divide by 3, and then raise to the 1 fourth power. So I say to the parentheses 1 fourth, close parentheses, equals. Note that we had a cube root button. We don't have a fourth root button. We've got a generic root button. So I've got this y root of x. And this is why using seven was a mistake because it ended up being four to the one fourth power. If I want the cube root of eight, I have to do three root eight equals. Nope, that's the eighth root of three. I need eight root three, is that it? Yes. You have to put it backwards because, I don't know. Notice that it says the y root of x. X is the first thing that you type. And y is the second thing you type. So if you want the third root of 8, you have to say 8 cube root. If your calculator says x root of y, it's probably the other way around. And now we're really starting to understand 
why I like the fraction exponents. Because uh, they can't, uh, no, no uh, phone calculator manufacturers can decide on what button they want. It's like controls in your car. It's like we all agree where the turn signal stop should be. That should be on this side, and should go up for right and down for left. It's always in the same spot. But like the wipers, sometimes that's a stop, sometimes it's a button. It's all normal. This should be standardized. I have a way to figure it out too. What we'll do is we'll take the CEOs of all the companies and we'll put them in a cage map. <laughs> and whoever wins, that's the one. So whoever wins the cage match, that manufacturer gets to decide, to decide what everybody's controls look like. <laughs> Unless it's the company that allows you to have daytime running lights that don't turn your tail lights on. I want to find out who said, oh yeah, we'll have the daytime running lights, but it won't turn the tail lights on. So we'll have all these people driving around at night with the daytime running lights on, which are bright enough to eliminate, illuminate what's in front of you, but you won't have your tail lights on. So people can't see your fucking car because you got your daytime running lights on because you don't know how your car works. Do you know what I mean? I don't know who decided that you should be able to turn the ones going forward without turning the ones going back on. That's dumb. And I come across it, like I can't drive anywhere at night without seeing at least one person driving with their daytime running lights on and have their tail lights off. And also one person driving around with their high beams get in your car at night and if there's like a little blue thing indicating your lights are on your fucking high beams are on turn them off and if you don't know how stop driving until you learn how your car works yeah but your car is old so your high beams are pretty weak Yeah, and also if you if you put aftermarket headlights in, I'm gonna smack you. Because they're gonna be aimed really shittily. Well it also doesn't help that because the high beams is just like pointed straight forward and like your normal headlights are pointed towards the ground. But when your when your headlights are six feet off the fucking ground, they're pointed right into everybody's window. So if you're driving a tall truck. It doesn't matter if you have high beams on or not. When you're behind someone, you're blinding them. You know what I mean? There should be a regulation on how high. I don't care how high the truck is, even though it puts everybody at risk. You, you need your, your headlights have to be really low. And then manufacturers will be like, oh, but then my truck will look stupid. And we'll be like, oh, yeah. We could do something about that. Make the truck shorter. You know what I'm talking about? Also window tints. I know it looks cool, but one of the important things of driving is that you're not driving yourself. We're all driving together. And one of the aspects of driving together is that we need to be able to fucking communicate. I need to be able to look at you and know that you saw me. And I can't do that if your windows are tinted to like whatever, like 0%, it's like 100% of the plastic. I don't know how they calculate. Five is the lowest. So if, you, if it's dark, I can't see your face. So like if you're if you see me standing on the corner and you're in your car and your windows are up and you've got 5% tint on, I'm going to wait because I can't see your fucking face. I don't know that you saw me. So I'm just going to wait. And you can get, you can be mad. You can be mad because you're the fucker that put the tint on your windows <laughs> so that people can't communicate with you. Right? It's not like we have to talk, but we do need to make eye contact. So that when we're driving, when I see someone a pedestrian, I can see them and I can just wave. I don't have to roll my window down and say, go ahead, I see you. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter that I would be in the right if I start walking and you run me over. I don't want to sue you from the fucking hospital. <laughs> I'd rather not go to the hospital in the first place, know that you saw me, and just walk. You know what I mean? If you tinted your side windows, pull that shit off. 
You're make, you're putting us all at risk for what? For vanity. And your car looks stupid anyway, so. <laughs> Tinted windows, very bad. There's a reason that you're not supposed to tint your windows because we need to communicate with each other when we're out driving. You ain't driving yourself. We're all driving together. What are we talking about? Oh yeah. How'd you grow up in the 80s to be such a communist? <laughs> If I can't see the person's face, I will not. I will just wait. I'll just wave them on. I'll just say, you, you go. Because I'm not walking out in front of your car if I haven't verified that you, you see me there. Because if you run me over, I want to know that it was out of malice. It's like when I, when I get hit by your car, I want to know, okay, it's on now. I don't want you to be like, oh, oh I just didn't see you there. But I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to put myself in that position. Right. right. Yeah, perfect. That's yeah, see, that's an important part of the communication. It's an important part of the communication. It's it all comes down to communication. You change your windows, you can't put people off. You can't communicate with the other drivers anymore. <laughs> this is fine when you're at home and you want to turn your phone off, but it's not okay when we're all trying to drive somewhere. Your car is not your choice. Your bad decisions about your car put all of us at risk, and that's not okay. That's why I get to say, in your stupid bald tires, that's a little bit of fucking tires. And there's little strips of metal sticking out of your tires, go get new tires. And if you can't afford new tires, then find a way to stop driving that car until you can afford new tires. You know what I mean? And if your boss says, you need to drive to work, tell your boss, you need to replace my tires. <laughs> Anything that your work is making you do, they should be paying for that shit. You know what I'm talking about? That's why if we switch to the model where I'm paying you to go to school because I think it's important, part of your pay is your transportation here. Like, it might be, it's like, well, I, I need to take the bus. I'm like, oh, here's your bus pass. You get this, I'll pay for the bus pass. You're like, oh, I live in a place where there's no bus service. First of all, I'm going to call same friends, I'm going to say, you need bus service in this location. And then if they're like, oh, well, I don't know, then that person gets voted the fuck out. I'm like, oh, next, you need bus service to this location. And if they're like, oh, no, they get voted out. Next, and when they say, okay, I'll get bus service to that location. And they're like, okay. You know what I mean? I mean, for 18 did it? That's excellent. We should be doing that for everybody. <laughs> like, oh, this is how I need to get around. This is how I need to get to work. I'm using my personal vehicle for work. You should be supporting me in that. If you live in a place there's no bus service, maybe we should just have company cars. That used to be a thing. Yeah, I don't think you can copy email. Anyway, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, saw me equation. Giant trucks. I think I'm super biased against giant trucks because I always drive very small cars. And the trucks are stupidly large. All right, let's take a break. Come back and talk more about solving equations. I'm gonna I'm just gonna move this one fourth to a different location. So